Hey, what's up, guys? Pat Flynn here, and I had a great question from a listener of my podcast the other day, and I figured it'd be actually pretty cool to shoot a video to share my answer with you. And that question was, Pat, now that uh, Will It Fly, my book Will It Fly, has been out for uh, about six months now, um, how's it been? Is it what you expected? And what are some lessons you've learned for self-publishing a book? Well, here are my answers. <laughs> You know, it's really interesting. The When I think about the first video that was ever posted in SPI TV, it was about how to outline and quickly create your first draft for a book. And that, that was actually the start of when all this stuff happened with Will It Fly. And, you know, I got Caleb, my videographer, through post-it notes at my face. And, you know, it just seems like it was such a long time ago. But this book now being out for about six months now, it's uh, it's surprised me in a lot of different ways. You know, this was my first book that was one that you could actually hold and flip through. I had published an ebook before Will It Fly that did pretty well. It was called Let Go. But that was essentially about my journey from how I became uh, or got laid off from the architecture industry and then became an entrepreneur. This one I felt was my very first real sort of nonfiction book. And whether you're a fiction writer or a nonfiction writer or maybe you don't even have any books yet and you're thinking about doing it, you know, hopefully these tips and these lessons I'm going to share with you along the way just give you some realism to, you know, what you can expect. Because definitely... This was a hard process. It took a long time to write. I didn't expect it to be this hard, actually, when I was getting into it. It is a lot of work. And coming from somebody who has been blogging and writing online uh, almost every day since you know 2008, uh, this project was uh, something else. So I think a lot of the big struggles that I had was just I had put this book like on this pedestal up there's this giant project that had to be perfect, right? And I think a lot of you can relate to this. We all see these kinds of projects, our, our new business that we're starting, our book that we're going to be making, our product that we're going to create. We put them so high in terms of how big these projects are that they often scare us and seem very overwhelming. And for me, that's exactly what it was. And when I was writing this, I actually caught myself um, making a lot of excuses to to not continue forward, especially when I came to chapters that were more difficult or chapters that had a lot of uh, research that needed to be done. I just would always go back to you know doing other busy work just to make me feel like I was getting stuff done. When in reality, I was just kind of walking away from this big massive project. It got so bad actually to a point where uh, I hired a coach, and I talk about this a little bit here and there on the podcast. But I hired a man named Azul, uh, Azul Torrenes, and he's amazing. He had actually been a student of mine who has now gone on to help a number of other people publish their books. And I hired him to be my accountability coach and to my to be my writing coach. And the number one thing that he did for me, you know, besides obviously keeping me encouraged and, and motivated along the way, was to help me break this huge project down into a lot of bite-sized mini milestones. So a book, right, made up of several different chapters, a lot of different topics. You know, we broke that down and they each became one little tiny project on their own. So I could just narrow down and zoom in on that focus on that one chapter and then at the end put everything together. I also realized that, you know, in that video I was talking about earlier about the first draft, um, you know, I even mentioned in that video that it's not supposed to be perfect at all, not even close. It's supposed to be just everything in your head into a piece of paper. And, you know, my first draft came pretty fast because I had done the uh, sequence of events that I tell you in that video, which is to uh, to to record your voice going through your outline and then transcribing that and that becomes your first draft. Well, taking that translation or that transcript and turning that into a written form that was, you know, more like one would read a book or, or like a book was written, that was really difficult. And then, you know, you just start playing this head game with yourself. Like, oh, I don't know if I should do this. I don't know if this is right. And, you know, I know, Zul, you're probably watching this right now. I mean, we went through several different kinds of, of iterations and journeys on exactly what this should be. And it's interesting because there was a turning point in the process. I ha actually didn't have the name Will It Fly until I was maybe halfway or even close to, to, to finishing uh, that sort of second draft coming from that tran transcription. Um, but when that name came, you know, it became very real. And I always say to people, you know, don't worry about the name up front. And, you know, I didn't. I created that first draft and then sort of draft 1.1 from there, but once I had the name of the book, Will It Fly, and I understood exactly what this was about and what I was trying to accomplish truly, it really started to solidify itself and put itself together. You know, the writing came out so much easier, and you start to notice yourself that when you begin to write, 
in the beginning it's very hard it's very you know kind of just what am I doing and then all of a sudden you start to get into your groove and sometimes it happens for a lot of people really quickly and for me it just took a long time several different months until I got to that point where you know I started to really feel that groove and that rhythm where I was writing every single day now another question that people ask me was well how was I able to get this book done and write this book when I had all these other projects going on well I made some sacrifices and I actually woke up a lot earlier so integrated into my miracle morning routine I wake up quite early uh, anywhere between 4 and 4 30 in the morning uh, I do my miracle morning routine which includes meditation and journaling and those kinds of things and then there's a part where I do writing and I kind of get some work done and things like that well I just extended that part and it became uh, it became to a point where I was just writing after all my sort of exercises and meditation and all that kind of stuff was done I would write until the kids got up so I had a block of about two, sometimes one, depending on when the kids, kids get up, but anywhere between one to two hours of writing time every single morning. And I just made it a habit to do that. And sometimes, especially in the beginning, I would only have you know, a page or two done. But then over time, I started noticing that as my flow was coming, that these mornings were extremely productive. And it was just very motivating uh, later on when I could see that you know, I had 8, 10, 12 pages, or I completed a chapter, it just really made me excited about going into the next day. And when you just really make in your schedule that time for that one project that you're working on, or that book that you're working on, I mean, you start to see things take off quite fast. Uh, let's see, as soon as the book was put together, I didn't realize also how many other people were going to be involved with actually getting it done. Because, you know, there's one thing of actually writing it in a word processor, I used Google Docs eventually to um, house all that information, but putting it all together was a big challenge. I actually got connected with a lot of amazing people, mostly through Azul, who showed me how to do things or actually did those things for me. And uh, this includes, you know, converting it into Kindle book format uh, or KDP. And that was, that's like its own project in and of itself. And then there was a the person who took my words and the visuals that I wanted included in there and actually designed the book. So putting all that stuff together in something, and you know, you don't even realize how much is involved here. But for example, you know, understanding where like the chapters end and where the next page starts. Do you want there to be blank pages? Where what's on the top of the pages? Is your name there? Or is the name of the chapter? What's on the bottom? Like all these other things that you never even think of until you're actually putting this thing together. And so that took a qu quite a bit of time to get it to a point where I felt happy with. Uh, the design part of it, but I'm very thankful for you know who I got connected with to turn it into something that made sense as far as an experience going through the book. Because it's not just about the content, it's about how the content is laid out too. Um, and then the other part of it, obviously, is the marketing aspect of it, which you know I was very happy that I got people involved with it early, even back to video one, like I said earlier. That was kind of the start or the tease of the fact that I was creating this book for people. And people just kept asking me, hey, how's that book coming along? And I kept dropping notes and hints there. Uh, along the way, I started sharing more and more and more, and it became this sort of lead up into the point at which the book was finally launched. Well, of course, it ramps up a lot more kind of the month or two before it comes out. So there was a number of things that I did that I felt were very successful in terms of getting the word out there and getting the marketing done. Uh, one of the things I did was uh, with the inspiration from Jeff Goins from uh, GoinsWriter.com, uh, he had actually suggested in my previous book launch to create what's called like a like a street team or an ambassador team or a launch team. And I had done this and really made sure to, to, to really focus on that because when you get a group of people, it doesn't really matter how big this group is. It could be 20, it could be 500. My group was about 500 because I have a larger email list, but that's, only, that's the only reason. No matter how big or small the group, they can be there to provide some amazing feedback for you along the way. So these people got early access to the, to the transcript. Um, they got early access to what the book looked like and some versions of it early. And they would allow, or I would allow them to provide feedback for that. And they actually were very, very useful for helping craft this book in a way that uh, it, it should have been crafted. And then, of course, when the book comes out, they're going to be very likely to promote it. And that's kind of why they're there. And that's why they're signing up for it and share it as well. And so on launch day, it wasn't like I just had made this announcement that came out of nowhere, right? I already had 500 people that were there to leave reviews. Not all of them left reviews, actually. That, that was the one surprising thing about this launch team. Um, as great as they were with leaving feedback, actually, it took a lot of effort to get them to leave reviews. So don't expect that if you have 100 people in your launch team that you're gonna get 100 reviews. Plus, some of those people were sprinkled in other parts of the world, so reviews in the UK are in the Amazon UK store. Reviews in the, in, you know, 
uh, India or in the the India store and so on and so forth. So, you know, you might not get the numbers that you would have expected, but still having this launch team is extremely important and obviously for the sharing aspect of it. That way, when people find your book on day one on Amazon, for example, they're not going to a blank page that has no reviews. They're going to one that actually has reviews. And always make sure, just a little side tip, make sure that if your launch team is going to leave reviews to be honest in that particular review that they leave that they leave that you uh, gave them early access to the book or they got an early copy of it because you all you always want those reviews to be quite transparent another component that was really successful was the reach out to a lot of friends and companions in the same space that i'm in to spread word of the book before it went live so i spent a good uh two or three months actually being a guest on other people's podcasts. Now, I chose specifically not to do guest posts because I felt like it was just much faster and easier for me to do guest podcasts. So I reached out to a lot of my friends. I reached out to, I think, 50 different people and about 40 had said yes. Uh, 10 said they just couldn't do it at the time and actually zero said uh, no. And I found that to be uh, pretty awesome. So thank you to everybody who helped share it when it came out. And obviously I did this ahead of time because I want to be conscious of other people's editorial calendars. So if you're going to be doing any sort of reach out and you want people to say things or post things or publish things on specific dates, please be aware that they also have things going on too and you want to give them enough time to be able to insert it into their editorial calendar or enough sort of leeway before they have to make a, a decision um, on whether or not they can help you or not. So I reached out to these people. I reached out to a lot of them on video and it was very personalized and I just asked them how they were doing but also said hey I have this book coming up I know I've been able to help you and most of the people I asked were people that I've helped in some way shape or form in the past whether it's as small as mentioning them in a blog post to actually helping them launch one of their products before through a JV partnership so you know utilize your network especially when it's something like a book I mean you put your heart and soul and time and sweat into this um, you deserve to have it be known that it's out there. You deserve that exposure, of course. Hopefully, you're providing a lot of value in it, obviously, too. Uh, but go out there, ask your network. Don't be afraid of the no's. Uh, the worst thing you can do is just not give people a chance to say no because, you know what, a lot of a lot of those people are going to say yes. And I was actually um, quite surprised that I had no definite no's. And, you know, the people who couldn't do it were very sorry they couldn't do it. And, you know, 40%, 40, 40 people, 80% of the people said that they could, which was amazing and absolutely uh, helped make a dent in the exposure that this book got. Now, after the book went live, you know, I remember there was an event called Traffic and Conversion Summit here in San Diego, and that was the week that my book came out back in February of 2016. And, you know, I remember checking the stats every day, as we always do when we come out with stuff, and it was doing fairly well. It was getting really high rankings, and then at the event, it actually became uh, one of the top. Uh, it, it was the number one entrepreneurial book on Amazon, um, and it was in the top. I think seven. I think it got up to rank seventy-two overall in all books, both electronic and uh, physical books in Amazon. So it climbed quite high. My goal was to crack the top one hundred. So I was really happy to see it do that. But on the second day of the event, I remember checking the Wall Street Journal because just somebody had once said that they had their self-published book um, become a bestseller, and you know I wasn't expecting that at all. And I I didn't even think that was possible. I thought they were just joking around. But I actually checked, and in that week. In the electronic book section, I saw that Will It Fly was the number six Wall Street Journal best-selling book um, at that point, and I was just completely blown away. And I remember sitting on the floor waiting for my Uber to come pick me up, and people were coming by like, "Pat, what are you doing? You're just sitting there like not doing anything." And I just was sitting there thinking about how awesome this was, and I would share that I was on the bestseller list, and you know, I ended up celebrating that night and um, going out and having some drinks and with, with some friends, and it was just a really cool event and again I didn't I never thought it was possible but it totally is and I think a lot of it was because of the way things uh, were stacked uh, in in such a short period of time so if you want to reach bestseller status um, you know you want to pack as many of those sales in in as short of a time as possible of course during a particular week and so there's a lot of lead up that goes into that like I said um, but it was it was executed you know quite nicely now it wasn't all me it was a lot of my team doing a lot of the work too so for scheduling interviews and things like that for example Jana and, and Mindy and Jessica on my team were you know just absolutely crucial for helping make everybody know when things were happening when we were supposed to get on Skype usernames uh, getting those files and putting them into podcast episodes for them or you know all that stuff it was all coordinated with uh, the thanks uh, thanks to my team I also have to thank Caleb my videographer here who's behind the camera right now he and I filmed a couple trailers which were a lot of fun 
You can find those probably linked to somewhere in this post or in the, in the description below if you're watching this on YouTube. But you know, you don't need to create trailers, but I felt like I wanted to dedicate some time to some video to share how important this project was to me. And I ended up getting my son involved because he's very much involved in, in this book in the first chapter. And to have him be a part of it too was really cool. I always try to include my kids in any way, shape, or form that seems like a good fit to have them learn about what daddy's doing, right? But it was it was pretty cool. And he ended up really enjoying the process and being a part of, of that trailer that we did. We also had a good idea to go to the Space and Air Museum here in San Diego and film there. And that, that was actually quite a challenge because you know we had to get clearance to do that and, and things like that. But we went and we filmed and, you know, there's people in the background walking around and, you know, coming across the camera. And we had to deal with that and, uh, stuff. But it, it was a lot of fun. And I felt like it, it reflected the message and will it fly quite well. Um, there were a lot of things that didn't go according to plan, though. Uh, for instance, when I launched the book, um, I, you know, th this is part of the issue with self-publishing, right? Or not really an issue, but something that you have to look out for. When you traditionally publish a book, typically with the publisher that you're working with, there's going to be a team of people there, or at least some people there that know what they're doing and how to do them. You know, for me with publishing this book and doing it on my own or with my team, you know, th this is in our wheelhouse. We don't do this all the time. So I don't know what to expect. I don't know when certain things should happen. We did some things, uh, a little too late. For example, we, uh, we're told that if we were to submit our Kindle book, um, if we were to submit our Kindle book, we would have it approved within 24 hours. But unfortunately, it wasn't approved until after 60 hours. And because of that, it had to it delayed some of the emails that were, we were sending out. So we probably didn't have as big of a hit or a push as we could have, but we still made up for it when it finally came out and sent that email blast out. But it was really interesting because I remember we scheduled a launch party that morning. I hadn't gotten any sleep. We were getting all the pieces together uh, using CreateSpace. I'll take more. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a second. But we had a launch party scheduled where people would sign up and uh, join me for a webinar. We'd celebrate I'd, I'd answer questions. I'd talk about the book. We'd have people share it. And I hadn't gotten any sleep. I was so tired and just so delirious. And um, during that call, the status of the KDP book switched from you know uh, in review to. Uh, being approved and just that happening live on the uh, on, on the launch party was was really fun but it, even then it still took an extra 12 hours before it finally switched over to one and then the problem was well the the uh, like with the way Amazon works you know my physical book was already on Amazon people were purchasing that but then the electronic book was on Amazon but on a separate page typically you see the electronic version and the paper version on the same page right well if you launch them both kind of at a separate time, they'll have separate pages. And, it, and it's not until Amazon goes through their algorithms and figures it out on their own automatically. It just, it's just happens automatically that they see that the two books should be on the same page because there's one electronic version and one paperback version. So I was hesitant to send an email out again because I didn't want to send, hey, if you want a paperback version, go to this page, click on this link. And if you want the ebook version, go to this page. Like it just didn't work out very well. Another thing that didn't do very well was the bulk bulk ordering. This is something that we did because we see a lot of other people do it, but I don't think we thought about the strategy as well as we could have. And by bulk ordering, I mean providing bonuses for people who ended up purchasing the physical copies and purchasing multiple copies. So there was a bonus for people who purchased uh, three. There's a bonus for people who purchased um, five. There's a bonus for people who purchased 10 and those, those kinds, kinds of things. Um, and those just didn't really go as big as I had hoped they would. Um, a lot of authors and entrepreneurs do that because they can get the bulk orders and they count toward their New York Times bestseller, bestseller status. But for me, you know, that didn't work out very well. Uh, but still, a lot of people enjoyed getting the book. Another thing that was um, that was a mistake was because of the timing of everything, because everything felt rushed, because we had this deadline and I had made announcements about when the launch was going to be. Um, you know, I'm looking at the back cover here now. This is much better than what it was when it was first launched. When it was first launched, this text back here was so small, like it was really tiny. And even the the text in the book, um, it was uh, because the book was designed from that person that, that I told you about earlier, it was designed in color. But when it goes through CreateSpace, um, unless you select the color version, which is massively more expensive, uh, and of course, you know, we chose the black and white version, um, because it was uh, exported in color, when it was converted to black and white, it was actually very gray and very light. So some of the first copies, you know, those rare copies, if you will, of those for the first run are very light and they're still readable, but you can tell that just, you know, something is off. And so even though thousands of people got their copy, it was still off, but it wasn't perfect. But you know what? 
nobody really said anything terribly bad about it. It just happened, and you know, me and my team were the ones that were more upset than anybody, and nobody really could make you know could could care. Uh, you know, no one could really care about that because they got the content and that that's all that mattered now we then redesigned the second book re-uploaded a new version to create space and got connected uh so that the new book came out and it was much more contrast and you know the blacks are actually black and that sort of thing so that that was interesting um you know and then the other part that i want to finish off with with was you know especially for all of you who are writing books out there and putting a lot of time and effort into these things you know, I was really focused on, well, how can I get the most email addresses for my readers here? Because on Amazon, you don't get to collect the names and the addresses, uh, email addresses from those who buy. You'd have to, you have to go and see if you can get those people to come to a particular website so they can subscribe to your email list from there, from your book. So I had an idea which was very much inspired by one of my favorite shows called The Walking Dead. Because for those of you who watch Walking Dead, you might remember that before an episode goes live on AMC, you see a little preview or, or a little uh, trailer, if you will, for something called walkingdeadstorysync.com. And if you go to walkingdeadstorysync.com immediately before you watch an episode, what happens is on your computer on that website, they show you some behind the scenes information, some really cool facts and data and images related to the scenes that are being played in real time on the website or on the on the television. So it was a really cool experience. And I figured, hey, is, is there any way that I can do something similar for those who are reading my book? Can I give them an enhanced experience? You know, most people who want to collect email addresses offer something on top of their book that is, you know, uh, I don't want to say they're, they're, they lack value because they, you know, there's always value when you add something in there typically like that. But, you know, it's typically just a bonus PDF file or something like that. Or some people even give away the audio file of uh, their ebook to be able to collect those email addresses, which, you know, if you have a funnel, that, that could work out very well for you, even though you'd be missing out on those audible.com uh, profits, which, uh, I know I'd said this is the last thing, but I, but now I want to talk about the Audible thing. This is just a very much conversational between you and me here. Um, but uh, g going back to what I was talking about earlier, that I wanted to create something that would enhance the experience of the reader. And if you had a chance to do this, I would highly recommend it if you're writing books. I created a free companion course. That's, that's, what, that's what I ended up calling it, a companion course that is laid out chapter by chapter, just like the book. So as people are reading through the book, if there are links that they have to click on, they're all in the companion course. If there's videos that explain some of the things that may be a little bit more difficult to understand in the text, they're there too. Worksheets that you can download that are mentioned in the book, they're in the companion course too. So super high value. A lot of people have actually reached out to me and said, I can't believe you're giving this away for free. Well, I am giving it away for free because I'm collecting email addresses, which will lead into other things in the future. But here's the big reveal of the people who have read the book at this point in time while, while we're recording this. You know, over, I think over 35,000 people have read the book. Um, I've collected over 33% of those email addresses. From people who read the book, I've collected, for every three people who read the book, I get one email address. And that is absolutely huge. These are numbers that are blowing internet marketers' minds because uh, it's a big challenge to get people from book to email list. So the companion course is working out really well. I'm very thankful for teachable.com. Uh, you can check out my uh, affiliate link at smartpassiveincome.com slash teachable. That program they have over there to help you get set up with your own course is beautiful. And it literally took me just a day and a half to get it all set up to create this companion course for Will It Fly. So that worked out extremely well. People are still signing up for that every day. Still people are using that every day to help them through the book. And it just makes them feel like they have something else in their corner to help them through this content. Um, let's see, other things. Uh, you know, I had said it was the last thing. But more things keep popping into mind. The Audible. So one thing I did after the physical book was launched and the ebook was launched, you know, about a month or two later, I I began at that point to start the production of the audiobook. So instead of actually doing it at home, which I had the capability to do, I had done the audiobook for Let Go before, uh, but and I did that for my home office. But I wanted to really crank this out and get it done in a very professional way. But I also knew that I had so much going on that it was going to be tough for me to do at home with all the other distractions. So I ended up going into a studio here in San Diego, went to a studio that my assistant found and going in and for two and a half days recording anywhere between three 
to five hours of content each day. Just literally just reading through the book. And you know, one tip I read the electronic version on my iPad, so I wouldn't have to flip through it. You don't have to, to kind of hear the book as you're reading through when you're recording audio. So that was one good tip. Drink a lot of water, make sure you're healthy because seriously, you're talking for so long and your your voice starts to get hoarse. I had to take a lot of breaks that first day. Second day, I felt like I got into a good rhythm. Um, and then after we recorded it, we listened to it and then I actually listened to the whole thing. Um, and there were certain parts that I felt like they could have used a little bit more energy, like the intro. So I guess the intro in the first chapter just lacked a little bit of energy. That's what I felt. That's what a few of my other team members felt. So I ended up booking the studio again to re-record those. And we re-recorded re re those in about a couple hours, but it was definitely worth it because I just think it took me a little bit of time and energy to um, just really get into the rhythm and, and feel like this was, you know, something exciting. And, you know, chapters three and on were fine, but the first few, you know, we had to come back to. Now, the results from the audiobook are actually quite incredible. I'm making a lot more money significantly uh, with the audiobook than I am with the books at this point. You know, in the beginning, uh, the ebook was huge. Uh, the physical book was huge, obviously, as well. But then those kind of trickled down. But then since I released the audiobook, these I've been consistently generating anywhere between $5,000 and $6,000 a month just from the audiobook alone. And I haven't sold nearly as many. You can make a lot more profit with the audio. Um, you know, the way, you know, acx.com is where you'd want to go to check out to see how you can do that. There's a lot of rules though. Am uh, Audible has a lot of particulars and when it comes to the audio that gets posted on there. There's certain things that you have to say, uh, you know, before the book starts and after the book ends. And there's, there's all these guidelines. You can look at them again on acx.com. But the book's doing really well. And more than that, they actually, Audible will pay you $50 for every brand new person who joins Audible and downloads your book first. It's kind of it's called what's a, what's called a bounty fee. So, you know the reason the, the reason that's the case is because they're banking on the fact that people they get your book first and they sign up for that trial, but then they're going to stay on and continue to pay monthly. That's how Audible works. Um, I listen to Audible uh, Audible all the time. I love audiobooks, and I'm more than happy to pay you know fourteen dollars and ninety nine cents or whatever it is a month to continue to get one credit a month to get new books. And so the profits are really sky high on the Audible books. So. Uh, if you are traditionally publishing or self-publishing, I would try to recommend uh, keeping the rights to that book. Right now, I'm actually working with an agent to take Will It Fly to another level. Now, I, I had the opportunity to have Will It Fly uh, be purchased by a publisher and actually go that route. But actually, I made the decision to keep this self-published except for international. So I'm working with an agent right now who's going to help get Will It Fly into other countries. And that will be done in a, in a more traditional type manner with those kinds of business situations and you know how the books get distributed in bookstores and whatnot. But in the US, because this is my first book and you know really it means a lot to me as being a self-published book and being a best-selling book as such, um, I really wanted it to be a self-published book. Now, traditionally published books are also interesting to me. And I'm 99% sure that my next book, when it comes out, will be through this agent and through the traditional publishing route. And I just wanna see, I just wanna experiment and see what happens and see how it goes. And then I'll probably end up doing another video like this and tell you what I did right, what I did wrong. And I'll probably make a decision at that point on what I feel is gonna be best for my future. And hopefully that will help guide you along your way too. Uh, but that book will likely get started by the end of 2016 and probably come out in 27, uh, 20, uh, at the end of 2017 or probably and more likely to be honest, uh, the, the beginning of 2018. Uh, but that's going to be a lot of fun. I already have some ideas on, on what that's going to be like. But I think also it's going to be a little bit easier because I've gone through this process now. And as with anything, as with anything, the first time you go through a process, it's going to be tough. You're not going to know what to expect. Um, now that being said, I said I was going to do the traditional route, so we'll see how that goes. And maybe it happens a lot faster. Maybe I just have the terrible experience of um, that. You know, I wish I had control over it, everything. Uh, but I wanted it to be self-published the first time because I wanted control. I wanted to see what it was like. And I know that most people have the option to do self-published right now. So do doesn't matter what you're up to, where you're at in your stage of, of writing. I just want to wish you all the best of luck. Hopefully this gave you some uh, good insight. And I think the coolest thing about this whole experience for me is uh, listening to all the feedback from people who have read the book, that people who are actually implementing the strategies and actually finding success with it. That to me is by far the most rewarding thing. So as you go along, if you find that you're struggling or you're overwhelmed, you know, just remember there are people on the other end who are waiting for this book to come out because you're gonna be able to change their lives. And when you hear that, 
testimonial or the person who actually uh, has made a change in their life because of you, I mean, there's nothing like it. And so just keep that in mind. Use that for motivation. Thanks so much for joining me here. A little bit more relaxed today on SPI TV, but just, you know, spitballing, talking about um, Will It Fly? And I look forward to talking uh, to you about my next book and seeing you in the next episode of SPI TV. Thanks so much. Take care.